Record. Yep, we'll record this so uh, there we go. People can watch online. So uh, yeah, so good morning, afternoon, evening. I think it's uh, good morning and afternoon for everybody on the call right now. Uh, this is our sixth installment of Systems Thinking uh, Research Made Simple. And today we're going to talk about distinctions, the identity and other which is, I think it's a pretty easy concept in general, but is incredibly valuable and has some really interesting applications. Um, I'm Matt Chazzy. I'm a host here at Systems Thinking Daily. Uh, and I'm joined only by Derek Cabrera today. Uh, yes. Laura's not able to, uh, to join us. So um, Derek and Laura, as you know, uh, founded the uh, Cabrera Research Lab with the vision of 7 billion systems thinkers. And this research is a really important, these discussions are a really important part of empowering uh, practitioners like us to use these tools in our daily uh, work with complex systems. Uh, today, we're going to be specifically talking about organize, the paper uh, that was published last spring called uh, Organized Information in Mind and Nature. And there's a link to that on the, in the community. And we'll go through, Derek will present for a bit, going through some of the findings and uh, some of the concepts in the paper. Always put questions into the chat as we go, and I'll do my best to, to manage those and uh, get everything answered as we're working through. Uh, we'll go, uh, we're planned to go till um, about 45 minutes or so, but we'll stay till the end of the hour if, uh, if we want to keep discussing things. So if you need to go at 45 minutes, then that's totally fine. And if you uh, want to hang out for questions, that's good as well. Um, the last thing I think you all are, but if you want to subscribe to uh, on the in the community, subscribe to the research uh, class, then you will be notified. We'll post the uh, recording of this in a week or so, and you'll be notified when that comes in. And I think that is it for logistics. So with that, Derek. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thank All right. We'll start off with some fun things since it's Distinctions Day uh, in the research space. So uh, and if you've seen these before, don't uh, don't uh, don't cheat. But uh, what do you think that is? What do you distinguish that as? I'll give you a second to think about it. And then we see that it is a pencil or the or rather the little edge point of a of where the yellow meets the shaven part all right what do you think that is i thought it was a red pepper but it's actually the top of uh the uh bottle there i thought it was a red pepper also <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> even with a little moldy spots yeah what do you think that is that is the stem of an apple. And this one's kind of interesting. Uh, what are those? And then we can kind of change the view a little bit to see if, if it helps. And change it a little bit more. And you'll notice probably most people will get it at this point because uh, a part of the whole indicates what the whole is. And then it becomes very clear that it's a tennis ball. Um, so, so the thing is, is made up of parts and it's also distinguished from the other. Um, we don't probably don't have time to show you the whole video, but I will send you, uh, the link to the video of this fantastic video of a dog named Chaser. I'll put the link in the chat, but basically he can name, I think something like 65 different little toys by name and he can go grab them. Um, and so we, they they did a little experiment with them where they introduced a new toy, which is that little doll of Darwin. And they said, go find Darwin. And Darwin's unfamiliar to Chaser. So Darwin, and so he went and he knows all of his toys except Darwin. And so basically Darwin, everything else was not Darwin. He knew that it was not Darwin. So he chooses Darwin, right, uh, event, relatively quickly. And there's a great video that sort of shows this. Uh, so that's, again, identity other. So the the identity of something is, is very related to what it is not. Knowing what something isn't tells you a, a lot about what something is and vice versa. 
Um, and they come together, no matter, they come together, identity and other come together. They're always together. If there's an identity, there's another. And that's incredibly helpful just to know because a lot of people don't see the other. So if there's an identity, there's definitely an other, even if you don't see it. So uh, look around for it and it'll, it'll be there. Um, so we'll, I'm not going to show that, but just dive into the um, the actual studies of distinction. And, and again, uh, some of you have seen some of these things, but we were studying the existence of these patterns, uh, both in, in nature and in cognition. So we, we are studying whether or not they empirically exist, whether or not uh, the theory of DSRP is correct, that they are dependent on the other elements like systems and, and relationships and perspectives, and whether or not they're effective, meaning that if you learn them and you're aware of them, that it makes you a better thinker or you know b better systems understanding, things like that. And the answer to all three of those turns out to be yes, uh, based on the research, but we'll go through some of uh, some of the research, not all of it, but a few of the fun studies. Um, so this was the first study. And again, this is kind of just st establishing a baseline for D and I and O that people readily uh, identify things and identify the other, but actually also tells us a little bit about where they, what they have more problem with and less problem with. So in this study, we call the orange polyhedra study. They were asked four different questions about an orange polyhedra. Uh, they were asked to click on the object and name it. Uh, they were asked in a separate question to click on the not object and name it. They were asked to click on the white space and name it. So that's the identity of the not object. And um, they were asked to click on the not white space and name it. And what we found is pretty interesting. We found that um, people have an easier time identifying and naming objects than not objects. That's probably pretty intuitive. When the identity is an object, they do better. When the identity is a not object, they do worse. When the other is an object, they do better. And when the other is a not object, they do worse. So the more tangible and object oriented we can make things, the better um, people will be at identifying them. Um, and the results of this study kind of indicate that uh, any identity, no matter how discrete or indiscreet, uh, it, that that identity is, is also perceived as an other or not identity readily by the human mind. It's also clear that even though the most basic things, identities like white space and polyhedra or cube, uh, will go by different labels or different words or terminology. So we have different ways of saying the same thing. Um, so it appears that words alone are not an adequate representation of concepts or things themselves and that any two people may use the same words to describe different things or use different words to describe the same thing. Um, another study we did was, was just to sort of look at something much more abstract that could be uh, lots of different things to any person. So we chose a classic ink blot, which is used a lot, um, so, so, sometimes called a Rorschach. Uh, in this study, which had uh, almost 400 participants, they were shown this Rorschach shock and just decide and just asked to describe what they see. And the data indicates something non-discrete and abstract, like an ink blot, can yield dramatically different and similar concepts. That might seem to conflict with each other, but. Um, Another way of saying that is people distinguish the same things both differently and similarly. So they have lots of different ways to see this, um, but they also see it categorically kind of in the same way. Um, this has kind of big implications for the relationship between mental models and reality, because it means that while we see things quite differently, these differences are based on common correspondence with the medium of reality. So um, an example would be that the 93% saw it as a person, 30, uh, uh, as a thing, I'm sorry, 31% saw it as a person, 40% um, saw it as a, uh, as a thing, and 
21% saw it as an animal, and then there's uh, a few others. Uh, so 93% of people saw it as three th things, even though there's great diversity within those three things. So I love the, uh, what was the, the angry chicken chasing me or something like that? <laughs> exactly. Fill in the blank uh, uh, examples. Yeah. So that seems really related to the idea of categories to me in the way that a category isn't real in the sense, but it's it's something that's created. But we also, well, there's only four here and everything kind of chunked into four. Yeah. So it, it's sort of the same, but <clears throat> but always different. Yep. And that shows that, that so from individual to collective types of thinking, you get part whole groupings or statistical clouds of similarity. Um, so, so you do have dependencies, uh, not only individually, but across cognition, if we're doing it socially. Um, so we sort of see those as statistical clouds of, of meaning making. And then another study, which I, I thought was a neat study was uh, called the dog tree burger study. And um, they were shown three familiar images, a dog, a tree and a hamburger. And they were given six word-based choices for each. And then they were asked, which is uh, dog, tree, burger, and then not tree, not burger, not dog, not burger, and not dog, not tree. Um, and then they were asked to check all the boxes that applied, all of the different uh, things that applied to that uh, picture. And this kind of shows that participants not only identify, in this case, kind of common objects, by what they are, but also by what they're not, meaning uh, a, a dog could just as readily be a not tree, right? And a not burger and vice versa. Um, but it also means that that tree and burger are both not dog, uh, which establishes a part whole set or a, an S of things that are not dog, which explicates the idea of the other as being a system. Does that make sense? So again, we're we're trying to see whether there's these dependencies that are predicted. And in this case, we see that the other is a part whole system and that the identity can go as an other naming or vice versa, uh, which is another prediction that's, that's confirmed here. And then we see similarly, but different for identity in a new, a different study, we asked them to name the shape. And um, as a baseline, they named the shape. And generally speaking, they named it, you know, square, triangle, and circle, but, you know, with, with things like box and cube uh, as synonyms. But what we see here, again, is that um, they were asked to click on the not object in the second question. Um, and notice that the not object is also a set or a, a you know a system part whole set or system so again the uh the identity is a system the other is a part whole system identity and other are intimately related identity and other are swappable um and so some really interesting uh things that come out of that um, and just as a summary of sort of, I guess we could say things that, uh, we can say empirically about identity, other distinctions, this is a, a, a pretty good summary of, um, what we can say empirically. Uh, so one is that the DIO distinctions, identity, other structure exists. It's universal, both in material and cognitive systems. Again, we're not showing you all the research here, but but it's all available um, online. Um, DIO is relative, meaning people will will make relative distinctions, but at the same time that it's relative, meaning in a pool of vast difference, we distinguish similarly, structurally the same, universally the same, but even content-wise, we we discover and, and distinguish. Simil similar in similar ways. Um, so that's really interesting uh, because we get great diversity, but also a tremendous amount of similarity. Um, 
left implicit distinction making confuses and made explicit distinction making clarifies so that 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 sort of is an argument for being more explicit about the distinctions we make uh the negated identities which are also called others really super matter right they matter to the way we make meaning they matter to the way we convey meaning um they matter to the structure of the way that we think uh it's super s dependent dio is super s dependent and massively parallel uh and fractal with r and p which we find in other studies from r and, and p so i'm not going to go over those today uh we tend to be overconfident about dio uh again uh, from a study that i didn't cover today because of the shortness of time and um awareness of the d rule of distinction making decreases bias which is uh, very significant. Um, and using the D rule explicitly can actually jumpstart thinking, meaning it, when people are uh, kind of uh, overwhelmed and they don't know how to get started to think about something, the D rule and awareness of the D rule can help them get started. And finally, uh, awareness of D rule actually improves thinking. So, and And again, that's not a study that I went over today, but um, that's a, a study on effectiveness with the uh, fish tank uh, paper. And that kind of covers everything for today. Yeah, Scott, go ahead if you have a question. Yeah. The second to last point, you're talking about how the D rule jump starts thinking. Yeah. So when I'm thinking about mapping, one of the, the things that I, I come back to all the time is the first thing is that splat map. Yeah. Where you're simply just capturing a bunch of stuff and putting it unstructured on things is that i mean that yeah. sounds like that's exactly what that is that is exactly what that is yeah it's you're laying down your identities and then one of the things you can start to do is challenge your identities think about the opportunity costs of your identities there's all kinds of think about the other um so there's lots of different things you can do just with identity other that are the next step to just getting started with throwing down a bunch of identities. But but in the research on the um, on on effectiveness, one of the researches that we did, forty eight percent of people uh, didn't do anything when asked to think about something. They literally just were kind of like shell shocked. Um, so so being able to jumpstart your thinking with a, like a little rule that gets you started like let's splat map or, or let's throw down some identities, um, whether or not they're right or wrong or whatever, let's just get them onto the page. Uh, that's, that, you know, that's a big thing if 48% of people are, are, can't, can't even get sort of out of the gates. I, I'm thinking about this in relation to some, some of the sacred cows of thinking, plus all of the system dynamics and all of the, the way that, people make it harder than it is in a yeah. sense. <laughs> um, well, and, and what I'm realizing is that, you know, one of the, one of the sacred cows is that it's all relationships. Yeah. Right. And so, so what I'm thinking is that even though these all exist simultaneously, a lot of people that I, you know, I hear about systems and they, they start with the relationships. Yeah. Like, Oh, well, they, and really, well, it's a relationship between distinctions or it almost feels like distinctions is even though you don't you can jump start anywhere yeah it's like well distinctions might be i hate to say this the best or or the <laughs> place to start you know that's that's a the loaded question well and and it's also a it's also important to point out that when you quote unquote start with relationships you're distinguishing relationships right so so it's sort of like a it's sort of like a, a a misunderstanding of what DSRP and is saying, which is that you you have to distinguish something from nothing in order to get started with anything. And so, uh, if you say if the first thing you do is distinguish a relationship, then you're distinguishing a relationship, you know, and and that becomes uh, kind of a thing, uh, and there is a not thing that that corresponds to that 
It almost seems, I think this is kind of what Scott's getting at too. It's almost like the the fundamental piece of all three because you can't do systems without distinguishing either, right? Because you don't know what, what system, what, what are the parts and what are the holes. I mean, it's, it's sort of the, <clears throat> the underlying electron or whatever of the, the DSRP in a way. A little bit, although I, 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 you know, I think, I think if, pedagogically, I think that's a very reasonable sort of place to start. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but I think in reality, these things are all interdependent and they all happen simultaneously. So the, mm -hmm. the perspective that you're taking, which at the very least is your own, mm -hmm. is manifesting the distinction. So you could say that the perspective happens first, mm -hmm. or you could say that the distinction happens first, or you could say that the the sure. whole happens first and then you distinguish, you know, so to me, they're all happening sort of dynamically together. And, okay. uh, and that's the interdependencies that we're testing in the, in these different research projects, because that's probably the main thing that people misunderstand about DSRP as a mm -hmm. theory and what it predicts is that, you know, oh, it's just sort of buckets, what I call buckets, right? There's mm -hmm. the D bucket and there's mm -hmm. the only thing that goes in D is D. The, mm -hmm. the D bucket is D's. And the only thing that goes in the R bucket is R's. And the only thing that goes in the P bucket is P's. And, and we kind of keep them separate and we do it stepwise. And that's sort of a deep misunderstanding of what DSRP theory is saying. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. really, I've been struck ever since our last session here, I think, of, of sort of how dynamic, you know, I think use the example of like, a you know, I'm the tallest person in the room and someone taller comes in. And yeah. then everything kind of instantaneously reconfigures all the perspectives, all the right. parts and holes for everybody in the room kind of instantly reconfigures, which is a pretty wild thought that I it continues to sort of amaze me. Yeah. And that that's a great example, because did you become the shorter person or did the taller person become the tallest person first? Right. So mm -hmm. we're arguing about what happens first, but these things are really dynamical mm -hmm. and they're happening, happening simultaneously. Yeah. And and so that that I think is really important. And the reason it's that way is because we're trying to model what the brain is doing. And, mm -hmm. and so if if the if the model was that simplistic, that it was stepwise and and always this before this, it just wouldn't cohere with the dynamicy and the complexity of what our brains do. Mm -hmm. So cool. I have a distinction story. Yeah. Um my daughter worked for Google mm -hmm. for six years as a project manager. And one day her boss came to her and said, I'm lending you to a different project. And as they walked across campus, he explained that these people have been talking around in circles for a year and cannot agree on anything. So my daughter sat into their meetings for two days and then raised her hand and said, would you like to see what a newbie pulls out of your discussion? So they invited her to present. She went up to the whiteboard and started asking them questions. And as they answered the questions, she mapped it up on the whiteboard. And she would nice. put things in and take things out and ask a whole bunch of questions. And at the end, they had a plan to move forward that they could all agree on. And she said, mom, all I did was ask them distinctions questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> awesome. It's sometimes that simple. It's sad how simple it is. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Very cool. I, I, Derek, I had a question on your list that's on the screen there about, can you talk a little bit about how distinctions decrease bias, sort of what the, some examples or sort of how that works? Yeah, again, if you just think about the interaction between I and O, right, and th and that I and O make up a D. So any D that happens is made up of an I and O and the relationship between them, which is co-kind of creative, co-co-existing, co-priming, co-evolving, uh, very dynamical relationship between I and O. So I is is about existence and O is about negation. Mm -hmm. So if you if you just think about those simple rules that are inside of the D rule. Then, then what you're doing is you're sort of saying, okay, number one, I make an identity. That's, you know, we're going to make, we're going to distinguish something from nothing or something from some other thing. And am I, um, you know, the, the, the end goal is in many cases is to try to make those cuts, those boundaries in the same places that nature makes the boundaries, right? We don't want a boundary that was just invented 
uh, and where where nature doesn't make a boundary, right? Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so that's decreasing bias, right? The bias of of putting boundaries in the wrong places. Um, challenging those identities is decreasing bias. Are these are these real identities or are these identities important identities in the case where we're not trying to mimic nature, let's say, um, maybe we're inventing a new technology or whatever. Uh, and how do we how do we find the edge of this identity? Well, the, at the edge of that identity is going to be near neighbor other identities, which we call the other, right? So and those others, are also identities. So I'll, I'll give you an example. When we are studying right now innovation and mm -hmm. uh, a huge part of the project that we've been doing for the last year is we're studying the near neighbors of innovation. That's what we've chosen to study. So we're not just studying innovation, which is the identity. We're studying search, discovery, creativity, and invention because those are near neighbors of innovation. And a lot of folks don't, don't kind of approach it that way is in order to understand where innovation starts and ends, you have to understand it's near neighbors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that'll decrease bias as well, because you're, because you're navigating that boundary between where something begins and where it ends. And oftentimes what we find is that that boundary is very fuzzy and it, it actually is very fuzzy across all the levels of nature. If your hand is on the desk right now, your hand is exchanging electrons with the desk, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we zoomed in with an electron microscope at that at that place, mm -hmm. it would be a lot fuzzier than when we look at it and we go, oh yeah, this is clearly my hand and that's clearly the desk, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think we're we're navigating that identity, that other and the boundary between them. Mm -hmm. And that's what's making a distinction. And all of that is all of that is decreasing bias. Interesting. So that that raises actually another question that I had about um, in the paper, you talk about the difference between um, boundaries and distinctions. You talk about sort of the big boundary, which I think the, the idea is that it doesn't really see the sort of fractal nature of the identities within it. Could you, can you talk, sort of explain it better than I did and then talk a little yeah. bit about that? <laughs> Hopefully yeah. I can. Uh, yeah, convenient. that's actually a really important point. The, the field of systems thinking, boundaries are not new to the field of systems thinking, but usually what, what, they, what they meant in, in history about the boundary is the boundary of the system. So if this is the system that you're studying, this is the not system. And you want, and they always talked about you have to have a boundary on the system that you're studying. But if you think about it, you're distinguishing the system, right? But you're distinguishing everything else in the system. You're distinguishing the parts. You're distinguishing the relationships. You're distinguishing the perspectives of of things. Everything inside the system is also a distinction. So these boundaries, this. It, until uh, DSRP, there was one boundary. But with DSRP, what what there is is there's there's boundaries at every single level of scale. In fact, every object, every relationship, is a boundary judgment uh, mm -hmm. uh, or a boundary navigation. And so it just shows you that that the D function is is universal across scale and um, fractal mm -hmm. rather than it being like a single thing that we have to navigate one time. That's really interesting. I have more questions, but uh, Scott or Linda, or Ryan, we go ahead, Scott. Um, I'll, so I'll ask one because I'm glad you left this slide up here. So in the pool of difference we distinguish similarly. So I'm wondering if that has to do with like the homunculus in a sense <laughs> that we are physical beings in time and space and we exist as so in other words like you know I see something that I can grab with my hands but yeah. I don't see the, the the ceiling because it it I can't interact with it and things like that and I'm just wondering if if that when when we distinguish similarly, it's based in 
physicality yeah. more than than um just some kind of like because it wouldn't be random because we otherwise we wouldn't be similar yeah i think that one of the whole list of findings is probably the most um uh interpretable right like i i, I think it could be interpreted a lot of different ways and i'm not entirely sure we know exactly how to interpret it um it is a finding what meaning you make of that finding i think could go in a lot of different directions but the way that I sort of think about it is that, and the meaning, the way that I sort of, um, the reason I think it has some deep meaning to it is there is a, there is an education actually, uh, uh, there is a, a kind of, a kind of concept or a, a, an opinion, which is like, we all think differently, right? Uh, to the point where, where, the, where I've, been criticized, for example, to say, well, you know, everybody thinks differently. How could you say that we're thinking the same universal way? Right. And I always say, you know, like you have the same, the same brain surgeon works on me and you, right. And, and you, you wouldn't argue that like my heart and your heart would need a different surgeon because it's the same heart and the same brain and same body parts, whether you're talking about the mind or the brain or the embodied brain or, you know, extended brain or whatever. Um, the point is that we we do think very differently. We think very different things a lot. And the brain can think a nearly infinite number of things. But in that world of infinite difference, we also tend to see things very similarly, right? Which, which means that like there must be some correspondence between us and reality. Right. We're not just making it all up. And I th I think I don't think this finding is enough to conclude that, you know, there's a, there is reality or anything like that. But I think it is consistent with the idea that there's an interaction effect between our brain and re and reality, the material reality or whatever you want to call it. And a lot of times humans are arriving at the same places. And and that's not by mistake, like you said, it's not random that that's happening. <laughs> Don't you think that's just bounded by our our senses? I mean, we have similar, you know. Again, there's people who are you know not sighted or whatever, so there's there's definitely differences. But for folks who sort of share similar senses, it seems like they would experience things, um, you know, according to the way those senses work, what they're capable of seeing and touching or whatever. Is that part of it? It's part of it for sure, but but I think you can you can um, kind of cross tab that with other sensory mechanisms, right? Like the machines that we build, or you know the, whether you know a bee a bee bumps up against the same flower, he they see the flower very differently, but the but the edges of the flower, you know, exist in the same place that the edges exist for us, right? So mm -hmm. they bump up against the same flower, is maybe one way to think about it. Now that they're seeing that flower in very different ways because their sensory apparatus is quite different than ours. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're experiencing that flower differently than us in some ways, but they're experiencing the physicality of that flower uh, roughly the same. And, and, um, and in that sense, we can sort of say, well, there's probably a flower there, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, there's probably something, maybe it's not called a flower or whatever it is, but uh we can, we can have some correspondence to reality. Right. Okay. Which is an argument that people make, you know, with perspective all the time, right? Oh, every perspective matters and there is no, there's no real reality. Everything's relative. And I think that's an extreme where you go, everything's well, yeah, things are relative, but they're also, um, that's why I love this finding. It's, it's in a pool of difference. We do things similarly. Mm -hmm. right uh, mm -hmm. because it's both it's an and both kind of paradigm rather than you know either either everything is imagined or everything is materially real and and like those are the two options and i think it's more of an and both right our brain so, affects the reality our mind affects the reality our thinking affects reality and reality affects our thinking mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm looking back at this the the uh ink blot yeah and it, there's four groups yeah people saw it as a person a thing an animal or an other 
Yeah. There's six percent in the other. And I'm wondering if anyone in the other category saw it as a verb. In other words, um, saw it as an as an action. Like, and it's like, well, no, they all saw it as a noun. They all saw it as a as a thing. Uh, and I, I and I would consider a concept to be a thing, unless it would be, you know, unless it, no one no one used the word jump, maybe, to describe well, the, that. The, yeah, so those are those are uh, researcher categories. So if we zoom into the data, and I can get you the data if you if you're interested to look at it. If you zoom in, there is there are verb and noun like combinations, like two women talking, right? So that's that's uh, they're seeing people, but they're also seeing uh, you know the the interaction between people. Uh, I forget what the data was, but like the the number of people that said there's two of something uh, was extremely high. But I don't remember what the uh, what that was. So this is just that slide is just a uh, a snapshot of some of the data, not all of it. So I'm going to try, uh, Ryan sent in a question and I'm going to try to do justice to, um, I think basically he's, he's talking about, you know, it's, it's challenging to make distinctions kind of in the real world with things like program management and project management, um, where they're sort of, they're related one sort of in the other, they're often talked about kind of, um, you know, so separately, but they're not totally separate and, uh, he says that's his, his brain hurts, you know, trying to, to sort of make the distinctions and, and make the parts, you know, appropriate in a case like that. So I guess the question would be, you know, how to how to do that, how to disentangle um, closely connected concepts or concepts that are sort of nested in some way when you're trying to make the distinctions. Yeah. In, the, in this case. So, for example, the, taking the example project management and program management right so you might think well we can cancel out management because they're the, they're obviously the same but maybe they're not right maybe there there's an interaction effect between these and that's getting into r but uh relationships that that makes the management of programs different from the management of projects mm -hmm. um and so you know to to some extent the, this might be different from this or distinct from this. And if it is, it's either because of the, it's because project is somehow dramatically different or, or subtly different than program and, and or the relationship between them, how, how they co-modify each other. And so that's the beginning of the distinction making that, you know, so you're seeing, so just think of it in that way, you have program management and you have, sorry, I'm, trying to write fast, but uh, you have project management. Just right away, you have these things as distinct entities, but you also have these things as being made up of parts, which are also distinct, and you have the distinct relationship between them. So the, at the beginning of this analysis, you're, you're sort of breaking down all the different distinctions that can be made. Mm -hmm. right? So in that, in that, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different distinctions that are being made, oh. right? Mm -hmm. Ide different identities. Mm -hmm. And then the question is probably, you know, you could start anywhere you want, but um, you could dive into, okay, what is different about a program from a project? How, how where, where is the boundary that where you have a project versus a program? Is a program the same as a project? Is the project the same as a program? Is every project a program? Is every program a project? Those kinds of distinctions, right? And so you, you're just trying to navigate this boundary. And, mm -hmm. and that's probably going to get you to zoom into the part whole system of that identity. And once you part whole that, you're going to say, oh, you know, maybe they're different because of one thing. You know, program is like, uh, I don't, you know, to be honest, I don't know, like, it's bigger. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's bigger. Maybe maybe you'd arbitrarily say it's bigger, or maybe project is smaller. You know, so maybe mm -hmm. maybe the one thing that differs between them is size, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and that happens with like if you look at an expression, this confuses kids in school all the time versus an equation, right? And you go, well, what's an expression? Well, it, it can have variables. It can have uh, you know all these different things. 
Well, the, really, the, the only difference between an expression and an equation is an equation has one extra part that an expression doesn't have, which is an equal sign. Hmm. Right. So you, you kind of see that, oh, it's this part that makes them different. Otherwise, they're exactly the same, which is why people get very, very confused by them. Hmm. Right. So hmm. maybe it's just the time dimension that makes a project different from a program or a size dimension. Mm -hmm. And then, then it becomes, okay, does that, does that difference alter management? And if so, in what ways, how will we manage something that's bigger versus something that's smaller? Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to parse all that apart. Yeah. Very interesting. And that raises another um, piece that I, I hear a lot in class and I, you've done it here, I think, but we always talk about identity other, but it's really identity to identity in this case, right? So yes. it's project management versus program management. And that's, there's nothing wrong with doing that, right? It's just um, how do you sort of describe the difference between II and IO, I guess? Yeah, I mean, by, by virtue of the fact that project management exists and program management exists, right? By virtue, this is why I say I, at the beginning, I said I is about existence and O is about negation, right? So if you say the uh, I'm not gonna I, I won't go too far into the linguistics of this, but but the fact that this thing exists means that in some way you're saying it's different from this thing. So this is an identity, and this is its other. Mm -hmm. But this is also an identity because this exists, and this is its other. Mm -hmm. And so they're both identities and others. So if you're trying to distinguish them, you are in fact distinguishing between identities and others. Mm -hmm. um yeah so so you're sort of looking i guess so it's not really ii you're looking at both halves you're looking at both the others and the identities on both sides essentially it's yes just a yes proper way to think of, absolutely to think about it. okay in Very a lot good. of cases though you're not really doing ii I comparisons like that because you're you're kind of coming from a point of view that's putting one eye one eye as kind of like higher than another mm -hmm. right so if i say you know uh science you know i'm going to come for the there's science and there's not science well so i'm sort of otherizing what not science is right mm -hmm. and and there's and then there's science right so sometimes you're doing that in the case of what ryan's talking about here he's sort of just putting these two things up as equal maybe and mm -hmm. he's sort of saying i don't i don't know what the difference between them is right right but so how do i distinguish of... that I mean, I think we do a lot of, you know, just a lot of the cultural issues these days are, you know, male, female, Republican, Democrat, black, white, you know, we, we have so many sort of binary II things that are both kind of wrong because they're not multivalent. You're not seeing the other flavors. Um, yeah. And they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're not super helpful <laughs> from a, thinking about this, the reality perspective, it seems like. Absolutely. I think I think anytime you you deal with a distinction again with anytime you make a distinction, you could you one way to, that I tend to think about it is you're you're forming a continuum with identity on one side and other on the other. And and a lot of times people just recognize the identity, don't recognize the other. The first step is to sort of see the other. So now you're seeing this bivalent continuum. But then understanding that perspective exists you realize that any one of these any one of these continuums can be broken into an infinite number of shades of gray between black and white and so mm -hmm. then you start to see this boundary as a fuzzy area that can have many more distinctions in it and that's what's mm -hmm. happening with binary terms and um uh you know th that the that they have fuzzy boundaries right mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the big ones that I a lot of uh topics in my classes are uh work life balance Right? Yeah. There's like work and life and people are all twisted up trying to, you know, figure out how to be on one or the other. And the reality is the picture picture that you just drew. There's there's not a, there's not an answer. There's a lot of options and there's a lot of sort of sub flavors uh, in there that are important to understand. Yeah. And most of these binary things that people have set up in science, they always fail to be terribly important. Right. They're, they're, it's always and both. Right. So if we. Mm -hmm. You know, first it's behaviorism and then it's cognitivism and they fight these terrible battles. And then we're like, oh, it's actually both, you know, or it's nature and it's nurture. And we, you know, which one is it? Which one is it? 
and they fight right. battles for 20, 30 years. And then we, oh, that's both, you know, so, you know, that tends to be the, the trajectory of these things, of these distinctions yeah. that we make. Interesting. I just want to welcome uh, Jess and Christian. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you have Thanks. any questions or thoughts, we're, uh, and I guess formally we sort of wrapped up at 945. I know Linda had to go or 1245, which depending on which coast you're on. Um, but we'll we'll keep going here for another few minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions, drop them in um, to the conversation or raise your hand. Go ahead, uh, Scott. So I'm thinking about the fropping rules, which are the rules for knowing how, when to stop, where we're mm -hmm. going to constrain this problem, framing plus stopping, fropping, mm -hmm. right? And when you, is there like, how do you know you're not going down a rabbit hole of distinctions? Because I know sitting in, you know, with a bunch of friends, you can go down into the weeds about, oh, well, it's this nuance. No, it's not that nuance. You know, I mean, just look at any kind of hobby. That's all it is, is people want to want to debate whether this thing is better than that thing. And I'm just wondering, how do you constrain that where you know, OK, you know what, I've done enough. Uh, you, the drawing that you have on the screen. I know the difference between these two enough. Well, maybe I need to slice it one time finer, but there's people who are just going to want to go down, 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 down. And I'm wondering how do you constrain that so that you can have a conversation about distinctions without saying, oh, we don't want to talk about distinctions because that's going to be another week. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it, I think, that the fropping is is designed to do that right the framing and the sopping is designed to do that in that you're you're sort of you're sketching out at the at the start or along the way it could be based on it could be based on a number of variables right it could be hey I, we only have 10 minutes to figure this out right like so that's called time boxing like put your we're going to time box this so like are, do we have 10 minutes to figure this out or do we have a day or do we have seven years right like <laughs> it, it, you know, that's going to determine how much detail you bring into the four. Um, how much resources do you have to throw at the problem? How many people do you have to throw at the problem? Uh, how de in order to get the thing done that you want to get done, how, how specific do we need to get? Um, so it really, you know, you use the the term hobby. That's a great example. Like if, if uh, how, how specific about the fly do we have to get, right? Well, if you're catching three fish per day and I'm catching two fish or two per hour and I'm catching two fish per hour, maybe I'm fine with catching two fish. But if I want to catch three fish, then all of a sudden I got to be like, well, you know, maybe it's uh, some kind of, maybe I got to wash my hands before I make the fly so that I don't get, you know, whatever junk on it or you know, whatever it is, some distinction that suddenly becomes important to cut the apple at that, at that, um, you know, thinness of slice. So that was a lot of mixed metaphors, but uh, it, it, there's really no, there's no like magic to it. it. It's just like, how much time do I got? What do I want to achieve? How much resource am I going to put into this? What do I want my end game to look like? And that's going to be important in the, in the fropping. Yeah, that's, that's it's interesting, life, yeah. Scott, because I think one thing <laughs> it's different potentially like from a hobby to a work, right? Work, you have a specific vision. You know, a hobby, I might just like, you know, learning about all the details of the flies. And, you know, it, it's basically my goal is just to like have fun and read arcane <laughs> details about it. <laughs> Exactly. Fly, uh, fly making. So, um, but you know, always testing. You know, I think that's the biggest one. When for from a work environment, you know, always testing. Is it useful? You know, the color of the stapler is not going to solve your security problem. So you've probably gone, you know, too too far and just keep retesting like what your goal is and the the fropping goal is super uh, super important. Yeah. Um. I wanted to, in the last few minutes, Derek, I wanted to uh, ask two quick questions. So one is, you know, when you're working with a group and you want to train, you know, train distinction making, you know, are there any just quick tricks on how to get people to do it? Just, you know, showing some examples like you did earlier. Is that, you know, is that the best way or are there any tricks to get others, you know, um, 
conversant in doing that? I think probably the biggest one is getting people to practice and getting them to practice on simple things that like maybe are just lying around the house, you know, like a lot of people are like, oh, I'm just learning DSRP and I, I'm going to tackle like healthcare. And you're like, <laughs> maybe start with like a cup or, you know, a ball or something like that and get, get the neurons burned where you're very familiar and comfortable with these structures. And then you can attack healthcare or attack your co corporate, you know, culture or whatever it is that you're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. So my, my suggestion is like on your drive to work, I, I'm always analyzing like what I'm seeing. Like, you know, I see a, a a big billboard and I'm like, huh, I wonder like why they built it, why they set it the way they set it. And why are they making that distinction instead of this one? And what are they trying to get me to do as a result of the board? And and did they were they successful? And what are the parts of the board that it's trying to get me to do that? Or what, you know, whatever it is. And, and so break down a billboard, break down a, the car in front of you, break down, you know, um, you know, traffic patterns uh, or, or break up, you know, think about those things in ecological systems of holes. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it really is just practicing with stuff all around you. Well, the great thing is like your brain and your mind it's it's even better than a handbag, right? Because you have to remember your handbag. You have to remember your phone. You have to remember you. But these things come with you everywhere you go, so you can mm -hmm. always just be practicing. Mm -hmm. And what else are you doing? Like you're 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 you know you're probably wasting time on your drive, or so you're just training the neurons to do DIO on things, to do SPW, to do RAR, PPV, all that kind of stuff. Cool. Yeah, I'm actually just looking as we're talking, I'm looking at my Zoom screen and I see Ryan doesn't have a picture and everybody else does. <laughs> exactly. And, and then I'm thinking, well, you know, what difference does that make in the conversation and how Ryan interacts and stuff? So, yeah. The other, big, the other big thing that you can do, Matt, which which I tell people and it's really powerful is we're always communicating with people, right? That's a big part of who we are. So uh, in communication with others, don't assume that you know what they mean when they use distinction X. Ask them. Don't assume it's the same meaning as what you think. Mm -hmm. Ask them. Go, hey, what do you mean when you say project management? What, what does that mean? I'd, I'd love to hear what that means to you because mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I might have a different meaning for it. And and when you do that over and over again you realize like, holy moly, like it's amazing we can even communicate with each other because we all have such different meanings, you know, all the time. We're using the same words and meaning dramatically different things. And sometimes we're using different words and meaning the same things. And so, you know, just asking questions like, what, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean by that? And I'm just always asking that kind of thing. Yeah, hey, That's a good Matt, way to practice. Matt, I'm going to ask you one. Because I think it's it's like we'll do this live real quick. So <laughs> you said useful in our daily work with complex systems, and I'm curious what you meant by that. Because when I heard that, I thought, well, I'm not working with complex systems. I'm just this guy sitting at home on my computer doing some graphic design stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, but you guys, you guys are working on complex systems. You're solving healthcare. You're you know whatever. And so I'm curious when you said complex systems what what did you mean good question uh so what was in my mind was more um i think what derek was saying you know solving the big you know global health or climate or or whatever but also what we all do for work right like any any time you're applying these ideas um i was thinking more work than than hobbies probably but um you know, anytime you're applying these ideas. So for you, you know, applying it to your design and your your customers and, you know, the world around you, um, definitely, because we're all surrounded all the time by complex systems. But that was what was in my mind, more kind of the work and sort of project orientation of it, I guess. Yeah. Good yeah. question. Cool. Um, well, I want to be, uh, I guess, last question, Derek. Any, what's, what's the next big thing for distinctions that you'd like to... Uh, research and or discover uh what's on the horizon well i think a uh, couple things one is, one would be uh, research similar to what what i've shown today so like the dependency studies and the existence studies just 
just further buttressing that um, research across the disciplines. There's some research that I want to do using fMRI to locate what's happening and where in the brain when we're doing D's and S's and R's and P's. Um, that that's a, a really interesting area. I, I I'm increasingly interested in possibly how the left and right hemispheres are handling D and S and R and P operations differently. Um, and, um, and then probably just modeling, like modeling research where we're creating kind of abstract models of, of, to me, it's just sort of like the counts, like, you know, if, how, how, if you do this, how, how big does it blow up and can we get, can we understand the patterns of what happens when that, when that thing blows up into a lot of different dimensions and, and those patterns can help us. And then probably the final area, um, would be just pedagogy. I'm always interested in how are how can we be more effective in in getting these ideas across to people in ways that make them more effective, right? Like are you know, are there are there better ways to um to uh explain things and uh, you know, but more you know, empirical studies on what what works and what doesn't, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, great. Well, that's a little bit of keep you busy. Yeah, <laughs> this is a a lifetime. that's awesome. I, I like that. It's interesting. The uh, I guess it's a lot more tangible fMRI, fMRI and things like that now to kind of see what's actually happening. So that's yes, interesting in exactly. that direction. Very cool. Well, with that, I want to thank you folks for for joining. Uh, this was a wonderful discussion as always. We this is the last of the sort of uh, regular research discussions that we had scheduled, but there's some uh, hopefully exciting new things we're working on. So look, uh, keep an eye in the community for the next events, and uh, we'll we'll definitely. I mean, this is an important part of what we're doing is to keep the the research coming out and uh, hopefully get some more um, students involved and others, you know, presenting research as well. So, absolutely. Thanks, uh, man. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody.